Hello and welcome to today's Digital Scholar webinar. My name is Katja Reuter. Today we will look at a number of digital practices researchers can use to build their digital presence and network. So our topic today is how researchers can harness social media to amplify their career. And I actually came across this paper authored by today's speaker, Dr. Teresa Chen, and I thought it might be helpful to get her perspective on this topic. We continue to receive requests from researchers um, to cover career building in the digital age. So I think this is a good fit. We hope that after today's webinar, you will be able to describe steps to build and manage your scholarly presence online. And uh, we also will share examples and use cases of how researchers might use social media to enhance their careers. Um, I wanna say that this is an overview today. So we will focus less on how to do advice. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Teresa Chan to you. Teresa is an assistant professor at the McMaster University in Ontario, Canada. Um, and with that said, please, as always, um, add your questions to the Q&A panel on the right side of the webinar. Teresa, thank you so much for being with us today. And please take it from here. Hi, everybody. We're just really sorry to have that kerfuffle. I don't really know what happened. It originally worked, and then when we did the sound check, and it didn't. Anyway, that's what happens when you're on uh, digital media. Um, so welcome to uh, this uh, discussion. I am taking a slightly different take on um, the topic. I still would like you guys to obviously consider how social media plays an important role in the 21st century um, and how we can use it to harness our scholarship. But uh, I would like to take a step back and think as knowledge producers, as people who discover new science, as people who are clinical researchers or bench researchers, how do we get the knowledge that we discover out to the public, out to the people that need it the most or that can operationalize it? And so I wanted to think about this topic from the point of view of strategies for knowledge translation. I have some disclosures. I do get some payment from the Alien Faculty Incubator, which is a program that I run to help enhance junior scholars in their academic productivity. And I do receive some um, funding, obviously from McMaster University, but also from a grant regarding um, knowledge translation. Um, and so that's pertinent to this topic. I do also volunteer for a number of different organizations online, and so these are all unpaid positions otherwise, um, And uh, but it does shade kind of my view of how I see the importance of social media and these uh, digital platforms. If you have any comments or concerns or questions, either now or later, um, please feel free to use the chat box, but also engage me on Twitter and we can continue the conversation. So what is knowledge translation? I think that's a really important question when we're thinking about how we can actually um, consider what the role of social media is in terms of uh, our role as scientists in the 21st century. To me, education is applied science, and that's where I did the base of my training. So in terms of what I uh, do is that I actually do a lot of work with regards to medical education and getting people to change practice and um, that has shaded my worldview so you need to understand that I am an educator uh, by training and have a health professions education masters and the research I do spurs from that angle. Um, but also, um, the other two applied sciences that uh, I think are quite linked closely to what we do is uh, the idea of marketing and the idea of leadership. Um, marketing is probably, you know, from the point of view of uh, most people, maybe on the more insidious side, the more quote unquote, evil side of things, because it is that they are trying to get you to buy something, that they are trying to actually uh, change your behavior in some way. Education thinks of themselves as the white knights of the of the bunch and uh, that uh, you know that they are noble in their um, desires that they are trying to change you for the sake of society for a betterment of humankind to educate you and elevate you and in leadership um, depending on who the leader is obviously um, leadership is about changing people's will to go lead them in a certain direction so all of these um, techniques all center around similar processes. And in the US, you guys have uh, something called implementation science, which we also use that term interchangeably sometimes with parts of knowledge translation, although they are not completely overlapped. The idea would be that um, uh, 
anyone that's done implementation studies will tell you leadership and change management is a huge part. And so if you think about it that way, education, marketing, and leadership are applied sciences. But what's the basic science then that powers that? And the basic science is obviously how we think and behave as humans. And so psychology is that basic science. So that's the bench research that actually translates into all of this stuff that we see in front of us. Now, knowledge translation is a very applied science because it is at the intersection of all of these things. And so I'm going to tell you three stories of knowledge translation from my point of view, from my personal experience as someone who does discovery or innovation work, and then I want to translate that to others. And so this is a big part of what I do. Um, so let me uh, take you through some, uh, some stories. So story number one is... Uh, this is a knowledge to action conceptual framework. And so you'll see the see in the handout, uh, we have another copy of this, but the KT, KTA um, cycle is a framework that kind of houses um, and is important in Canada for how we kind of think about knowledge to action. So how do we take things from knowledge inquiry, synthesis, production, uh, pr create products and tools, and then how do we um, implement that into action? Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit of story of uh, some of the work that I do. So I am a researcher in health professions education with an interest or one interest in um, programmatic, programmatic assessment and learning analytics. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, my story from this point of view. So um, I've done some papers. There's probably about 10 papers in a series um, where we're looking at our local implementation of a workplace-based assessment program uh, where we've generated lots and lots of data points with regards to the analytics of performance uh, by our residents. Um, and because today in this day and age, there's a, actually quite a bit of buzz around learning analytics and big data for assessment in medical education. This is a hot topic and um, I've engaged in formal works of literature. Um, and, you know, the usual KT tour is you go on conferences and present your abstracts and stand awkwardly by the posters and wait for someone to hopefully talk to you. Um, and uh, that's definitely something. And if you're lucky enough for some of my papers, I've been... Um, on the podium talking about it and discussing my papers in a panel of top papers. And so I've been very fortunate to have several of those opportunities in this program of research. But that's not necessarily enough. And so we thought we might synthesize things for um, our end users. So in uh, learning analytics, our end users are actually our program directors and people who are policymakers in health professions education. So uh, a big part of what we try to do is uh, we try to actually um, create a translational paper that would aggregate a lot of the wisdom that we've been working on um, and bring in obviously the rest of the literature surrounding the idea of learning analytics and medical education and we authored a uh, translational paper but we didn't just stop there um, we made sure that when we authored this paper we kind of built in what would what you would see there as almost like an auto inter um, um, a figure that is very easily tweetable, that is easily excisable, um, and is basically an infographic. So we made sure to make sh um, make that an initiative that we had within this paper so that it was easily knowledge translated. And then the other thing too is we thought the end user in this particular situation, being a program director or, or an administrator, you can see what we did here, I'm gonna do the drawing part here, um, is that we actually thought about each of the target audiences and actually um, created a table where we kind of explained how learning analytics might actually apply to them. And so that's a big part of what we were trying to do is to really understand uh, the end user and speak to them in some way. And then because the um, paper was quite interesting and is a hot topic right now, we actually got invited to um, be on a podcast. And so um, sometimes some of us might be feel a little shy about talking about our work, but this was, you know, like a knowledge integration of a longer chain of research so i'm fairly comfortable with talking about it at this point so i didn't shy away and i leaned into that and was able to um actually uh, be part of this podcast and uh, beyond that what we did was take all the knowledge that we've acquired with our um, pilot program and translate that into work product uh, for implementation now that uh, in our residency program at uh, in our division of emergency medicine, we actually do have um, 
a uh, new competence-based medical education framework um, that we took all this information that we had done before and um, used it to inform our local implementation of this new competency-based model of education that the um, accreditation body, which is uh, the Royal College or our, our version of the um, ACGME has rolled out in Canada. And so a, a big part of um, knowledge translation is not just making sure that people are using your own material, but actually thinking about how you can implement it at your shop. So sometimes that's something that is harder to do for various political reasons and personal reasons, but it is something that I think is important for us to consider. And so my take home point from this story is that KT and education can take um, many forms. Um, you can be your conference circuit, it can be your posters, but don't just st stop there. Uh, do consider how, um, if you have a paper out, how you might, if you get a chance to write an event invited commentary, or maybe a review article at some point that aggregates a bunch of the wisdom that you have in a program of research. Um, some people actually in, in engage in blogging as well. Um, so there are opportunities for that. So I was recently invited to write a um, blog for the John Hopkins Closler blog, C-L-O-S-L-E-R. So Osler with a C at the beginning, um, a C-L at the beginning. And uh, in that situation, um, I was involved in synthesizing kind of a program of research and innovation that uh, we had uh, recently kind of like culminated and so that, that's an opportunity as well so you might be asked to write a guest pot po uh, be on a podcast as a guest or write a guest blog post for instance um and so i think those are also important venues to disseminate your information and also help people see the relevance and then I think local implementation is another way of really bringing home the knowledge that you do and making sure that people local to you have access to the to, to the benefits of the work that you've done. And so that's an important kind of uh, these are some take home points that I wanted to make for this first story. And so in this case, um, I did everything from knowledge inquiry down to synthesis, down to product tools. And then uh, using the tool, we identified the problem and then implemented it locally. And so these are the parts of the KTA cycle that, uh, that we engaged in for this. So story number two is the story of another thing, which is my thesis. So for my Master's of Health Professions Education, I did actually do a thesis looking at how physicians think and learn in multi-patient environments. So um, as a junior trainee, I was tasked with seeing kind of one patient at a time in the emergency department, and I'd leave a shift absolutely exhausted, having seen all, all of eight patients that shift. Um, and at some point, I looked around and realized that's actually probably not how our attendings function. And um, sometime in my... Um, fifth year, I realized I was in the sea of chaos, seeing all these patients at once. And I looked at the, what well, we use the tracker board system to keep track of our patients. So it's an electronic system. I looked at the tracker board and I knew, I knew everything about each one of the patients with regards to my patient care that day. Um, and there were 16 patients on the board and I was well on top of things. It was mid shift. And I thought, hey, how did I go from that first year resident all the way to someone who is a fifth year resident and complete control of the entire department. And I thought that that was an interesting thing. And so I embarked on exploring this um, in my uh, master's thesis. And so that's um, where basically I went and, and did my work. And then I was done after my uh, thesis was done in 2016. I had coffee with my friend who was like, um, what are you going to do with this? You've got the conceptual framework. You've got a bunch of other papers. They're more like a needs assessment. You've got these suite of papers. Sure, you're going to write it up, but what, what are people going to do with this? How are you going to get this out there? How, how are people going to make sense of all of this? And so a big part of this uh, was to think about my work product and my knowledge product here and think how could we actually get people to engage with this information? And so, um, you know, we could make a case. And so we did kind of look and see what people were doing out there. There wasn't a lot. Obviously, there, there are very few strategies. And so there were some things and there were lots of barriers. So I thought, OK, those are important to keep in mind when developing my next step. Um, and but 
on the whole, there are very few uh, instructional strategies. Probably experience is the way that most people are doing it. And so from my thesis, I knew that there was a need uh, to develop new ideas and new ways to kind of teach and handle this uh, skill set. And so I'd engaged in a knowledge inquiry. I've done some th synthesis um, from that point of view. Um, I identified a problem. I've also thought about these assessment bar as these barriers and to knowledge use. Um, and uh, and I was thinking, well, what what's the next step? And looking at that framework, you can see. Sorry, looking at this framework, you can see that there's probably one area that could be really accentuated. And so what happened was that. Uh, I had a coffee with my friend Matt and we were talking and they were both kind of board game nerds. And so we thought, hmm, could we make this, could could we make a board game that could help teach and learn this, uh, pe people teach and learn this? And uh, that day I uh, basically went home and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And um, it resulted in uh, a sketch of a board game and uh, the immediate text and recruitment of a team and then some, um, med students came along and we actually created this serious board game. And so the idea is that uh, I'll tell you a little bit of how we created that work product um, uh, and actually used it um, to kind of communicate. And so not all what I would consider social media needs to be your traditional um, media that you consider as uh, modern day social media. So you can have Twitter, you can have Facebook, but sometimes the media that you need to help people engage with your work might actually be an old school board game. And so we developed this board game called Gridlocked. And I went back to my educational design and I thought there's the current six steps of curriculum design that we kind of went through. Um, and uh, in that way, we actually went through a, a, a fairly defined process to review other games and literature. I have to say this is probably the funnest lit review I've ever done, which is to look at what people have done and also play a bunch of board games to try to inform my practice. And, and so that's what we did. We also then created a basic mechanism and then we did a series of plan, do, study, act cycles in order to improve the game, probably about 50 of them. And so the students came along and they helped with developing that. That's a copy of them. Uh, this, sorry, that's a picture of them playing the board game in an initial, initial pilot phase. Um, and uh, more than 50 PDSA cycles later, we had a gridlocked game. I make no money off of this game. We donated all the proceeds back to the university. Um, and so that's what this is. And uh, it's available, obviously, for purchase. But mainly, we've kept the costs low so that people can actually um, actually just uh, use the game to teach and learn. And so with that, uh, we engaged in what I consider reverse knowledge translation, which is we took a knowledge translation product and then published back back in the medical literature after doing some testing. And so there's this whirly gig that can start happening when you KT something, innovate, and then test the innovation. You can end up being in a bit of a cycle there. Um, and my take home point here is to think about your strategy for your audience. Sometimes engagement with your uh, content, the, the knowledge that you're generating is is the most important thing. And so, yes, you could send a tweet about your um, knowledge uh, that you've discovered and you can tweet about your paper and you could put it out there. Um, but do think about other inventive ways. So whether it's a board game like we created, it could be um, a video, it could be other formats. Think about who your end users are and target them in a way that helps them engage with the work that you've just created, right? So if you're a bench researcher and you've created a new vaccine, well, you know what, getting out there and um, talking to physician and also lay people groups about uh, the, uh, the the importance of vaccinations might be a strategy you have to engage in. Uh, it might be something that you are worried in this day and age that people won't buy it, but I think that it's something that you have to pursue if you feel that your knowledge is important for people to uptake and use. And so definitely think about your audience and how you can engage them the best. And so in our case, because we wanted to make um, uh, the learning safe. Uh, we knew that most, you know, like most teachers are not going to let a first year resident run the department, but they might let them make some decisions in a board game. And so we thought about how we could create that safe environment and yet engage people. 
And so the third story that I have is specifically around the idea of social media, as we all know it as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, ResearchGate, those kind of things. And so I thought I'd go into the idea of um, how we get from that knowledge creation um, triangle up until the actual action cycle. And I think um, there, I always thought that there was a gap in this diagram. And lo and behold, if you zoom in, wait, is there something there? No, actually there isn't in the diagram, but I thought there's actually actually another conceptual framework um, that's known as Pathman's Pipeline. Um, and it's uh, it's actually from vaccination literature and people were thinking about how we get people um, from an, um, an actual endpoint in the discovery work all the way through to actually um, watching people actually benefit from these things. And so uh, Pathman's Pipeline has uh, several kind of important key elements. The idea is that you might have high quality clinically relevant evidence, um, but uh, awareness, acceptance, applicability, uh, the ability, um, their will to act upon it, their agreement with all of that stuff, and then the adherence to it in the end. All of that are all sideways in which you can, sorry, all of these are side paths in which your um, knowledge translation can actually go sideways. And so at each level, um, high quality evidence may uh, be what you put into the system, but because of various reasons, um, it might not be what you get out of a system. And so Pathways Pipeline, I think, really helps hone in on the idea that before you can have high quality evidence get to the actual bedside, you actually need to make sure there's awareness. And so I think this is where social media really fits in and awareness and applicability. And so from that point of view, there's like thousands of journal articles being published per day at this point. There's so much information out there. We really can't keep on top of it. Machine learning algorithms might have some way of helping us filter the information, but that's not the be all and end all. Plus, there's a lot of competing things. Uh, do you believe this study versus that study? There's skepticism as there should be. Um, but awareness and acceptance are something that don't come that easily. And so the idea would be that in social media, the way that we know it, Twitter and Facebook might actually help with that awareness factor. And actually, if you engage it properly, can help with the acceptance factor as well. And so these are the social media that I can think of and uh, everything from Twitter to Instagram to Facebook. Um, I mean, you've also got WhatsApp and more personal WeChat, personalized versions of this for closed social networks. But I do think that it's important for us to pay, uh, pay attention to the fact that these are always changing, always renewing. There's always a new kid on the block. Who uses MySpace anymore? No one, right? Um, there's lots of people that are going from Twitter over and experimenting with Instagram now for knowledge translation. So these are the kind of things that we need to think about and pay attention to. Now, it used to be that you would have Web 1.0 where the producer would just make a website and the consumer would just consume the website. And so this is the model that you get kind of the original Huffington Post was, you know, Arianna Huffington and she's writing on her blog post, right? Um, but Web 2.0 came along and really disrupted everything because Web 2.0 is the era of... Um, of uh, end user creation. So whether that's a tweet, a podcast that you record and upload, um, or really accessible website generation. So it used to be that you have to actually code in HTML. And I remember going to like, I was that nerdy kid that went to computer camp one summer. So I remember like typing all the code and not even short code, like raw code. Um, and that was not fun. Um, but now with WordPress, with all of these other like Squarespace, it's literally just like working on a Word document or um, a PowerPoint and you just click and drag and move things around, right? So Web 2.0 really democratized the ability for us to do it. But of course that meant the dark side is that people can misuse it as well. And so the era of fake news and all those other things kind of started uh, coming, rearing its head. But in the end, this is how a lot of our trainees still feel um, and a lot of our audience members for the people who are, we're trying to target and reach. And so this is probably an old quote because Facebook is probably for 30 to 40 somethings. Um, but uh, that's the generation that got Facebook when it came out. You know, like you watch the social network movie and uh, and and we were all in university and that we're the Facebook generation, uh, or at least I am. And so um, 
it, people do feel that if you're not engaging in these media that you don't exist, right? And so um, it used to be that docs would kind of like just get out into practice, uh, stick up with their community shop, and especially for emergency medicine, we don't usually have synchronous rounds very easily. Everybody's working a different shift. We're like ships passing in the night. We don't really get together and have rounds necessarily more than once a month, let's say. And so that's something that, you know, you kind of get isolated. You feel like you're, you're lost a little bit. And so um, Levin Wenger talked about this phenomenon and was modernized by a, a, um, a other researcher named Dubé, the idea of a community practice or a virtual community practice. Um, and so in response to that loneliness, I think people reached out to other spaces where they could communicate and asynchronously uh, discuss things, stay connected. And, and I think that that's a natural tendency for us to find and seek out others who are like us. And so um, for me, that online community of practice is actually Twitter. And so you'll find that as a as a knowledge user, as a clinician, so as a as a physician who actually takes care of the patients, I I actually do use Twitter to survey the the literature, the latest greatest, because now I can crowdsource having followed, you know, four thousand or so other people who are very smart. When I start seeing some signal to the noise, I am looking for a journal article. Um, I scroll through, sorry, I scroll through, I'm not looking for a general article, but now five people that I trust in my personal learning network are all tweeting about this new JAMA article. Well, I don't just list, like look at what they say, but I actually then actually go download the paper and say, this is probably an important paper, let's look into it a little bit, right? And every so often I roll my eyes after reading the abstract, I'm like, I don't think this is that important. But every so often it'll be a great find that I will um, use, file away, maybe bring to journal club, maybe discuss with my peers and then see about implementing it locally. So that really is something that we, um, we often do think about in terms of how we can uh, change our practice. And so increasingly, a lot of clinicians are doing that. So if you're not a clinician, um, know that the clinicians are surveying Twitter to find in heat seek new literature because there's just so much paper, so many papers being published all the time. We can't do it alone. So if everybody does a little bit of crowdsourcing, then this is what can happen is that um, we can create signal in that noise. And I mean, like I mentioned the Huffington Post before, but this is a five year old article and they still think that every, at, back then they thought that every young physician has a professional Twitter account. I would say this for researchers as well, because if you are um, someone who has information um, that is new, that is excellent, and part of being an academic is doing all that, um, you have to, an obligation to share it because if you did a great study and then no one reads it, that's just as much of a travesty as having done the research and then not published it. So I think that this is where the next generation of knowledge translation uh, people are really kind of pushing the envelope. And so I don't know how many of you will have heard of this, but it's there's a movement out there. It's under a hashtag, F-O-A-M-E-D, FOMED. Um, so free open access medical education was a movement that probably predates its actual hashtag and name. Um, but around the early 2000s, um, we, uh, um, we have actually um, been sharing this information. So a lot of educators were um, impressed by their Web 2.0 technologies mm -hmm. and started archiving their notes online, their teaching aids. Um, one of my role models and uh, um, uh, and a mentor is Michelle Lynn. She started, uh, she was on the national speaking circuit and uh, she was uh, getting lots of invitations to speak. And she was also a talented educator, award winning. And she just was sick and tired of make, making the notes all over and over again. And so what she ended up doing was creating these one page notes called the Passes Verbis cards. And she actually uh, put all of them on this little website called Academic Life Emergency Medicine. Um, she got a blog spot, I think it was, or an um, account and, and just started uploading these uh, one pagers, PDFs. Um, that was the beginning of the Alien blog. Alien.com is now um, a blog that receives uh, almost 2 million page views a year and is strategically aligned with a number of major emergency medicine organizations, including research groups like the PCARN group. Um, and so they are engaging actively in um, education and knowledge translation at that, at, at, that, um, at that, I guess, the nexus of those two things. And so um, 
this movement uh, is predated by quite a bit. So um, if you look back on 2012 was roughly when Mike Cadogan and a bunch of other people um, coined the phrase FOMED. At the, uh, they were at an international emergency medicine conference. They were having pints uh, appropriately in Dublin, and they looked at the foam and said, "Okay, could we do that?" And and uh, <laughs> could we call it that? And uh, cutesy enough as that origin story is, um, it, that is just the brand because the concept has been there for almost a decade prior to that. When we map back to all the early um, earliest emergency medicine um, uh, teacher-driven websites. And so knowing that, um, yeah, like I said, Alien's up to like 1.5, 1.6 million, uh, million views per year. Um, so it's quite a bit of stuff out there. Um, and I think that this is a response, this movement is a response to knowing that people are out there and looking for content and that people are actually also coexisting quite frequently on social media in addition uh, to their personal um personal lives in real life. And so acknowledging that, I like to call this um, learner-centered education. Um, and the 2.0 version of it is, for me, uh, hiding the kale in the smoothie. I do not like kale, and uh, I love smoothies. And so the idea here is that, uh, can we sneak a little bit of awesomeness into, um, sorry, a little bit of healthiness into the awesomeness of, uh, of social media? And so um, Canadium, like I said, is a website that I volunteer for. I am a co-founder of this website. And uh, we often uh, publish blog posts on things that are not the most exciting things, but are educational nonetheless. And so um, we have content that we create that helps maybe uh, knowledge translate in a fun way some of the information that's out there um, and so we'll get on Facebook and we have a Facebook account and we also have a Twitter account and now an Instagram account and so we when we have any posts we actually put stuff out there and so um, we cross syndicate the posts uh, people sometimes just go to the website and find it natively like so they go directly to the website sometimes they google search it and we're well well searching and then optimized in the back end but a lot of people actually come to our content through facebook and so we syndicate it through our facebook page and um i mean i think there's a lot of people listening to this webinar but it ain't uh 2500 people and so with the kind of reach that we can gauge uh through facebook um this um we can actually get our content, which already has a wide reach because it's on the web and it's through our website. Um, but there's actually more opportunity to make sure that it's discoverable for other people. And so in this, um, the sea of cat videos and increasingly wedding pictures and baby photos, um, I feel a little less guilty when I can learn something alongside everything. So I actually follow a, f a number of journals. I follow a number of uh, FOMED sites as well. And so what I do is I actually um, have this all integrated within my feed. Um, and so that's something that I, I think has been really cool um, for myself is that I just integrate it within my life. The other thing that we have done uh, with uh, Canadian and PCARN and Alium is, uh, and uh, Boringium was um, a site that I worked with that amalgamated into Canadian. So um, that's why there's that Boringium logo. Um, but we've engaged in trying to do the same thing for guidelines and for papers. So for PCARN, um, people were still not really using the PCARN rule. So when we worked with the PCARN group to create these cool little infographics and little cards that the, the, if you want to print them out, they can be actually physical cards. Some people have them as posters in some of their um, emergency departments. And then we also, um, when the 2015 AHA guidelines dropped, we actually got an advanced copy from the Heart Stroke Foundation and AHA um, as a um, as they would give to the press. And so they considered us a press organization. And we actually then created these infographics and they went viral, like around the world. People were tweeting photos at us to say that they printed them out and put them up on the wall and their emerge and people were learning from them. And so that was pretty awesome. Um, and so infographics are another thing that's out there. And uh, more recently, um, Andrew Ibrahim has actually been writing about something called the visual abstract. And so you can look it up here at 
this website that I've got there below there, surgeryredesign.com slash resources. And um, you'll see a lot of journals are starting to adopt this um, as a vehicle to uh, communicate that they have a new paper out there. And so JAMA has been switched over to this format, Annals of Surgery, obviously. And, and I think Annals of Emergency Medicine um, are experimenting with these formats. And so we, uh, I will highlight that these uh, things are out there and that uh, they are ways that you can communicate to people that uh, you are done a piece, you have done a piece of work and very quickly give them a snapshot um, of what you've done. So uh, we did actually do a randomized control trial of the, like a picture of the abstract versus the visual abstract. And obviously the visual abstract generated more clicks, but if your article is paywall, it won't generate more, um, uh, more downloads, for instance, because the membership subscription, but with open access journals, or if you actually do have uh, um, the money to pay for open access accreditation for your paper, this might be a great way to augment, you know, your um, readership and eventual citations. And so uh, Michael Hyatt is a book, has a book about how to manage your social media presence um, and get noticed in the noisy world. I think this is a for your average uh, person and is not dedicated to scientists, but I think that the conceptual framework in here is actually very useful. And so he talks about something called a home base or a platform. I, I like to think of it as a home base. Um, the idea is that something, this is something that you actually own that you, like let's say a website, I have a, I have tchan.com um, and uh, that's a website where you can check out uh, the uh, various um, things that I do and, and it's something that I control. I can log in and I can change it at a moment's notice. And so that's what you would consider a platform. For some of you, it might be your university website, but most of the time that's administered by someone else. So it's just something to think about. You don't have to have a website. It's a bit of a, some people think it's a little bit vain, um, but I, I, I use it because it's a way for people to find me. And so it's something that I wanted to make sure that people could reach out to me and, and, and engage with me. And I found, and several of my uh, collaborators have found me that way. So that's why I have a calling card website where people can find out what I do. Now, um, you don't have to do it for just yourself. You can actually have it for your uh, for your entire research group. So for instance, this is a metric study website. Um, and if you go to metric study, I mean, M-A-T-R-I-Q study.org, um, you can actually click through our site and see what we've done. Um, because uh, we use it uh, to recruit our um, collaborators and people who are going to help us with our, um, we do a lot of measurement and rating studies. And so so we actually have a lot of people who are rostered through this website. But the best thing is that we also, if you click on the research agenda site, part of the site, we also get to pay, we get to tell the story of our papers in the way that we want it to. And so what's interesting is that in medical publishing, you have absolutely no control in the end about whether or not uh, your papers come out in the right sequence. And it's something that really annoys me. My friend Brent told me, we kind of joke about how uh, he's like a the um, uh, co-lead of this research group. I would say that he's the real lead of the research group in many ways. Um, and uh, and what it is is that like uh, the analogy would be if you were a TV show producer and you had to shop around your um, every episode for your show like uh, to different networks and you might go to hbo and they and you're the producer of game of thrones they're like we like your pilot but we only like half of season two and maybe one episode in season five the rest you're on your own and now all of a sudden you have to go to nbc and abc and you have to sell them each of those things that's kind of how the story um gets told in our science because we're shopping around in different journals this one rejects it um uh, that one takes it and then the journals also have different speeds because some of them are faster than others in terms of their production and so all of a sudden your linear story that you thought you had when you set forth to do a research uh, agenda is no longer in a linear form if people look at the chronological order they can't make sense of it so having a home base where you can tell your story in the right order uh, allows you to then explain this paper came before this, and this paper is how this one came about, and people can understand what you've been doing. 
And I think that that's actually a really important thing to consider when you are a high functioning researcher and have multiple papers that link together. This is something for you to consider is do you have a website for your research team, uh, especially if you have lots of collaborators or you have a lab where you have students. This is a great way for them to also not to have to do their own website, but rather while they're still a trainee in your lab and doing related work, you can put this together. There are actual research collaborations in other areas. I think the, um, um, there's the, uh, there's actually quite a few people that do work in mentoring or in self-determined learning. Um, these are the things that people have are big research collaborators and they actually aggregate everyone's work on a zone into their website. And so th I think that these are probably the way forward in terms of a research um, collaborative or a research team is that you probably should have a lab website where everyone can have their stuff and be interconnected. Um, and I think it's never been easier to actually own your website. So Squarespace, WordPress, Wix, these are all platforms that are out there. I do not have stock in any of these and I do not make money off of them, but I found that these are the ones that everyone kind of refers to me when uh, when I say, hey, do you, you want to start a website? What should I do, right? Um, and then there, in Michael Hyatt's next step, there's the home base, like we were just talked about, and then there's embassies. So embassies are places where you don't own the platform, but you actually rent some space. And so Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, you could argue Google Scholar, definitely ResearchGate, Academia, EDU, you don't own the platform, but you have some control over that space, right? You don't have to, you don't own Facebook.com, obviously, but um, you can have a page there. And so that's what an embassy is. And so there are scholarly embassies like even iBooks. Um, if you're someone that doesn't mind doing some graphic design and layout, um, iTunes and iBooks might be a great way for people to um, find out about your work. So if you're working on some kind of manual or something like that to translate some of your knowledge, this might be a great way to publish it. Um, ResearchGate, like I said, is another avenue where people are engaging in a scholarly manner. And then there's also a Google Scholar, um, which again is owned by Google, but um, does its thing. On the flip side, um, in medical education at least, we have these repository um, places uh, and MedEd portal, um, which I'm showing you here, is now PubMed indexed. So lesson plans and pe people's work product uh, that they've developed and put out there to um, teach people uh, is now peer reviewed and published online for people to actually use. So, so this is another scholarly outlet for you for to have an embassy. And then the last thing is listening posts or outposts. The idea um, in the Hyatt's uh, conceptual framework is that um, you also not only want to push things out there, but you want to listen to what people are saying about you. And uh, you guys have already had a whole webinar on altmetrics, so I will not bore you, but definitely check out that other webinar if you want to learn more about the nitty gritty of altmetric. But for me, I like to think about altmetric as a listening post because it can tell you what people are saying about your paper. And so I think this is a really cool function of it. So for instance, the paper that we wrote about the alien faculty incubator that I helped found and helped run still. And so the idea would be this little donut over here on the website, you link to it. Um, and then you can get the summary. It tells you sometimes if it's, uh, you know, got a good rating or attention score is high, it'll tell you always oh, in the top five on the date that I did the screen grab. Um, but what's interesting to me is this listening post function is that you can actually click on this tab Twitter, as you can see up there, like so you can see where people are um, looking at it at a glance. But also if you click the tab that says Twitter, um, you can actually see individual tweets about what people are saying about your uh, paper. So I think that that's pretty cool. Um, and it gives you the upper bound of how many people might have seen tweets about your paper. And I think that this is an avenue where you can continue to explore and see because, for instance, I've had colleagues at my shop recently come under fire for one of the papers in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so um, I think it'd be really important for them to know that there was some controversy and to pay attention to the Twitter uh, uh, feeds about that paper to see what people were saying, right? Because just because people know about your paper, sometimes it can be because they know about it for the wrong reason. And then for you to get out there and make sure that people aren't just misinterpreting what you've done, but rather to engage with people so that you can make sure that they're, they're actually doing it, okay? And so take home point number three is that I think you have to find and understand your audience. What makes 
what is popular to your audience make sure you understand what media they use so like i said sometimes you create something like a board game which is social in some ways and communicates your message sometimes you're going to create a tweet because you want to get a lot of eyes on this and you want to get it out there in some immediate fashion sometimes you might need to build a whole website because um you want people to understand the entire story and the tweet won't do justice right so these are the things that you need to think about when you're actually um, trying to reach a target audience. And sometimes you might have a different audience for your research agenda and then have a separate avenue for if you're um, someone that does work with advocacy groups, you might have a separate web page just for um, talking directly to patients, for instance, uh, to make sure that they get the clear cut information. These are the kind of things that you can think of. And so in summary, what is knowledge translation? I think uh, you have to think about, it's a way for you to mine that gap. It's uh, in the age of social media, it's about how you make practitioners aware and engage with your end users. I think it's about understanding that there is a gap between knowledge production and then uh, I'm putting things into action. And I think that Pathman's part, uh, pipeline is a way for you to harness and shut off those valves of where there could be leaky faucet along the way to implementing and using the knowledge that you've just created. I think you can expand your reach and I think that uh, social media allows you to do that. I think step two is about creating a plan and so plan your action, try to figure out how to do it, use frameworks like the KTA cycle to audit what you have done, what you could do, try to find the gaps, right? Um, and I think number three would be to educate people um, and and plan to teach so you can reach. And, and this is me obviously coming at this from an education point of view, but a lot of the time I find with uh, people who do um, science work is that for some reason they think that people will just get their paper magically and that they will all of a sudden everyone will just start adopting it and anyone that's tried to teach you know my goddaughter is like six and so anyone that's tried to teach her to do something you know that you can't just like plop something in front of her and then she'll do it right like you have to there's a whole process to engage get people's attention make sure they're listening to you make sure they accept and they're not fighting too much um just like we would with our residents you have to plan to teach them they don't just magically learn right these are the things that you have to do so fold in a mindfulness about education as a scientist when you're trying to communicate your science to everyone else, right? No, don't just tell people about it. Think about how you would reach and engage them. And so I always think back to Kern's six steps of curriculum design because I think it's a great way for you to kind of like um, harness an educational framework that can help you figure out how you're going to actually get the knowledge out there to people. So think about how uh, and what the needs are, whether that's in a general way, like what are people written about it previously? What do your local doctors or phys um, um, patients need to uptake your information? Develop some actual goals and objectives, figure out the right educational strategy for this audience, and then go ahead and implement it and then get feedback and make it better, right? So these are the kind of things that you can use to think about how you can educate your end users about the work that you've just done. And so I think that these two frameworks, when you compare and contrast them, there's a lot of overlap. So in the handout that I gave you, which has all um, the, uh, actually the handout has all the citations. So if you want to take a look at that um, handout, and it also has all of these frameworks in them. So you don't have to like take notes or screen capture or anything, just download the handout and you'll be able to see it. Okay. Um, and so at the end of the day, to me, knowledge translation is just in many ways education, right? It's an applied science. It's probably a mix between education, marketing, leadership. Um, and it's a way for you to take the knowledge that you've created and definitely get it in front of the people that can put it to work. Um, and so I think that's what I would say um, is my point of view is that I think we can harness the power of psychology and all of these applied arts to do a better job at translating our knowledge and implementing our science into, into reality.
awesome. So, um, Katya, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, to speak to your group. Um, I would love to hear questions. If people have questions, please type them away. Um, like I said, the handout has all the citations. It has all the diagrams as well, and 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 uh, the the steps that I've articulated today um, in a very much more user friendly format than PowerPoint slides. Because I actually don't think the PowerPoint slides are a great way to get information. <laughs> Theresa, thank you so so much. We will share. We will share. I think you have to mute your mic. Oh, when I'm uh, talking, but thank you. okay. I'll mute it. Okay. Okay. So, Theresa, thank you again so much for for such a robust talk. Um, this was really great, and the examples are fantastic. I think they really provide a, a good overview of what can be done beyond a publication. So, thank you for this. Um, we will share the handout in the follow up communication. So, please don't worry about that. I wanted to chime in here. So, you shared a lot of examples, and we all know how busy physician scientists and physicians are. So, how, do you have any advice um, in terms of where someone who is newer to this kind of career building approach should start? You shared a lot of, of initiatives and activities, and someone might feel overwhelmed, someone who is new to this. What would be your advice in terms of prioritizing? Um, so can you hear me? Yep. OK, so what I would say is that um, I would start small. I would like literally get a Twitter or Instagram account, just one account, and, and, uh, and, and, and look to see what people are doing, right? Follow a couple of people, feel free to follow me. Uh, feel free to follow um, actually your digital scholar training program on Twitter and see what people are engaging in, right? Um, just like anything else, you learn by looking and following along and you will get in there slowly. Um, the other part of it too is to reach out to your media people at your university because usually they're actually quite excited to help you um, and they're usually quite engaged in training you or getting you ready for all of this. Sometimes they'll do press releases, which is an old school way of getting the word out, but it is something that uh, people can do. Um, and so you can get some hand holding there, which I think is a good thing to start with, right? Because now you, if you're worried about whether or not you're going to do it right, et cetera, et cetera. I think you can read some of the um, the stuff that um, we've experimented on, uh, see if you're interested. If you're a graphical person, infographics would be a good place to start. Um, if you're not, then maybe just a really smart tweet uh, might be a way for you to get engaged with uh, getting people to know about your paper. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't try to like take over the world tomorrow. I would just start small and try one thing, and if it works, do it again. And the other thing that I would do is uh, reach out to educators because I think they can be a great source of inspiration because they do have different conceptual frameworks. Reach out to your leaders because they might also have different conceptual frameworks um, and expertise. And, and don't think about yourself as a solo act. Most of you are in embedded within research groups. You're embedded within departments, divisions, uh, clinical groups. Um, find out who your social media mavens are within those groups and ask them for advice and help. Um, and I think that, that that's how I would start. When I first started in 2013, I had like two followers on my Twitter account. My brother had made me get it in 2009 and then I didn't use it uh, for the time I was in residency because I didn't feel safe. I didn't really understand it. And in 2013, I decided I'd start getting online to um, for various reasons, stay up on day, uh, stay up to date, uh, pay attention to what people are talking about as a continuing education platform, and then I also vol started volunteering for the blogs and podcasts at that point. And so now I had something to tweet about because I had like a blog post to tweet about and stuff like that. So um, I started out small, very small to to begin with as well. And uh, yesterday, yesterday, uh, oh no, the day before, I just reached the ten thousand follower mark. So. You don't have to, you don't do it in a day. You do it in a number of years. Um, but uh, if you're earnest and you put your work out there and you contribute in a meaningful way around scholarly thinking, um, people will pay attention and follow you along. It might not always be Twitter for the rest of my career, obviously, but I do think that engaging with others in a scientific way is an important way to be a part of a part of a society of scientists. So I think that, um, I would suggest just starting out small and taking a day at a time. OK, that's a nice note to end on. Um, um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you so much, Teresa, for being with us today again.
Okay, thank you. Bye.